Is that okay? Can you see the slideshow? Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, my topic today, I guess, is, is deliberately provocative and I'm aware that I'm asking more questions than I'm answering, but I hope that you will enter into that spirit and also that we can raise some um, interesting and useful questions today. I'm also aware that I'm, I'm, I'm adopting a very broad brush approach and it's, it's probably quite a crude uh, style of review and speculation that I'm doing here and you know that I'm not uh, paying sort of intense attention to all, all studies that are going on at the moment and I hope you'll forgive me for that I'm just trying to get I suppose a, a wider perspective on things. I've also kept referencing to a minimum in the presentation because you know I just think it's, it's quite difficult uh, the way in which you're tuning in and, and I'm talking and the screen and things like that so um, again uh, if you'll forgive me on that and I'm very happy to, to provide um, references for you. So I suppose if we're thinking about readiness and relevance for what's coming or what might be coming, um, it's always good, I think, to kind of revisit uh, what our basic concerns are, you know, and of course, in language policy, it's all about managing languages, but of course, it's never really about the language and, and we know that. Um, it's about managing people, controlling people, controlling resources, controlling power, controlling access. So there's some sort of control going on and some sort of management. And I think revisiting this, we all know it. I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know already, but I think revisiting this and keeping this in mind as we move into what for me is a sort of a mind boggling um, future, um, that to keep in mind that it's in someone's interest to manage this and to control this and language is a tool for that. And keeping that in mind, I think is, is, is crucial. And also I always find Monica Heller's idea you know that, that, that language policy is about naturalizing, uniformizing, objectifying social groups, their cultures, their boundaries and their languages and again I think that's something useful to keep in mind because I find myself getting very distracted by a lot of the hype, a lot of the technology, um, things that I find very hard to understand and um, you know th th keeping these sort of basic concerns in, in mind as, as we travel into a, an exciting future. We're living it a little bit at the moment, even in this talk, we're living it. Okay, so um, I've, um, I've, I've, I've picked this, this framework to look at language policy um, with. Um, so Tom Friedman is a journalist and a writer. He's not an academic. It's not an academic theory. You're much more likely to find his books in airport bookshops uh, where they're targeted at frazzled executives who are uh, jet setting around the world, although maybe not at the moment. And so it's not, it's, it's not based on extensive um, academic research or anything about that, like that. Uh, it's a theory around globalization and he divides globalization into sort of three eras to date. He talks about globalization one, in which he sees countries as agents, globalization two, in which he sees companies, particularly multinational companies as agents, and globalization three, where he sees individuals as agents. Now he stops there, so we have to kind of uh, uh, make it up after that. His theory is partial, flawed, um, unsatisfying. It's Western centric. Um, he's overly optimistic about globalization and particularly about the role that technology plays. He has this idea of the flat world platform and that uh, web two and digital technology have uh, leveled out the playing pitch globally and that we can all compete and collaborate. And he doesn't take into account any of the inequalities that technology um, brings with it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's very far from perfect thesis. Um, and it's not even a thesis, he wouldn't call it a thesis. But I find his framework actually quite compelling. And I think it gives us a very interesting framework of agency. That's what struck me when I read his book for examining language policy and sort of thinking through these eras in relation to, um, to language policy and particularly in relation to agents in language policy. Um, so for that reason, bear with me and, uh, and see what you think. But I actually find it quite, a, quite an interesting way in which to look at uh, the work that we've been doing. I also think it's good to get theories from outside our discipline and, and to get theories from outside um, academia and to get insights there and they can help us maybe to to look at what we're doing from a different perspective. 
Okay, so if we think about um, Friedman's Globalization 1, and if we think about language policy 1, he sees the key agents here as being um, countries. So what might this look like in terms of language policy 1? Well, in terms of our context, you know, we're thinking about colonialism, we're thinking about uh, the development of, of nation states, we're also thinking about post-colonial states. I'm thinking of Tom Ricento's work here, you know, where he shows how post-colonial states have kind of aimed for, or for singularity um, in their language policy um, in the wake of, of independence. And also in relation to minority language revitalization and revival. So it's where countries, uh, governments, institutions, state institutions do the work and do the management of language policy at a very macro level filtering down into schools and all sorts of other um, agents of the state. And speech communities here are geographically delineated, territorially delineated, or perhaps institutionally delineated. And, you know, we know very much what we're dealing with here. Uh, we're dealing with uh, a lot of de jure policies, but also long established and uncontested de facto policies. So in terms of um, language policy kind of readiness and relevance, uh, I guess this is perhaps, you know, our, our, maybe I could call it our comfort zone if I'm being provocative. It's, it's where a lot of our foundational theories and concepts come from. And even if we've moved away from those, you know, and, and even if they're criticized and critiqued, it still is the mainstream perhaps against which we uh, measure a lot of, of, of our concepts now and, and our policies. So, if there was, I suppose, a slogan or that a quick, a neat summing up of language policy one, it's, you know, language is a tool to fix problems in society and language is a problem for society that can be fixed. And again, um, I'm thinking of Tom Shento's uh, um, work here and many other people, Sue Wright um, and, and, and many others. Moving on then to language policy two, which um, for, um, for uh, Fried if we take Friedman's framework here, um, it's multinational companies who take over. So this probably happened around the mid uh, 20th century to the late 20th century when um, companies began to um, outgrow their uh, national boundaries. You're also dealing with an increasingly marketized society um, and uh, the growth of, of, of multinational um, and global companies. So companies are growing their national boundaries and um, moving overseas, and then some of them becoming actually global. So breaking their links perhaps with national territories. And he sees these multinational companies as key drivers of globalization. So if we think of speech communities here, we do still have some which are geographically and territorially defined and which align with those that were created in language policy one. So for instance, um, I think De Swan's taxonomy here of the world language system, again, it's, it's, not a perfect, uh, it's not a perfect theory, but I think it's a useful one. Um, he would argue that you know, these, some, some central languages, so some national languages um, are, uh, get their own speech communities from multinational companies. So they, they get localized product services, interactions, all that kind of thing. So a general rule of thumb is uh, the more economically attractive, the more likely it is that globalizing companies will um, respect normal territorial or geographically uh, created speech communities and existing speech communities. Um, with less economically attractive parts of the world, um, this era saw um, perhaps a, a, a re-establishment or reinforcing of some um, lingua francas or in De Swan's words, super central languages. So what I'm thinking of here from my own work is um, these MENA, for instance, um, groupings which companies have. So Middle East and North Africa groupings um, where English and French are used as languages. Um, and so kind of crude, big kind of uh, uh, supernatural grouping, supranational uh, groupings of countries. Um, and then also uh, Deswan talks about hypercentral English holding the whole thing together. And of course, that's what we've seen as a real outcome of this multinational era and multinational companies is the uh, consolidation of the position of English as global uh, business language. So, you know, there are some uh, de jure policies within companies and companies uh, 
have them, but there are also a lot of de facto policies in this in this era. And I suppose more meso level, if we think of multinational companies as being at that level. However, of course, you know, a lot of multinational companies are much bigger uh, financially and economically and in terms of their, their force and their reach uh, than certain countries are. Um, but still, we would probably think of it in this way. Now, if we think of language policy here, I would say this is perhaps an era we haven't totally got to grips with and that we haven't um, you know, completely understood. And there have been studies of this, and you know, I'm thinking of colleagues uh, from the Czech Republic looking at multinational companies and policies there, um, and language policies there, but it's not an area, if we compare it to language policy one, we have a lot more work done on that, and, and we've thought about that a lot more. And this era, I would say, we perhaps haven't thought about as much, or we haven't thought about perhaps the processes. We've thought about the outcomes, like the, the dominance of, of English, and the results of that but we haven't perhaps thought about how that has come along and how companies have actually um, shaped that and if we were to have a um, excuse me if we were to have a kind of summing up or a slogan around this era i would say it's that language is a problem for international business and how that problem gets solved um, uh, leads to um, outcomes so for instance, one thing that's always struck me in my own work is, you know, language is, is constituted as, as, as a problem. Um, multilingual countries are seen as unattractive for multinational companies if they want to headquarter. Um, you know, one of the reasons that in Ireland we have so many, um, uh, so many of the tech companies is because we're English speaking. We're in Europe, but we're English speaking. Um, and, you know, so multinational, even though we're, in, we're a, a, an officially bilingual country, um, but multinational, multilingual countries are seen as unattractive and they're, they're considered politically unstable. Um, so a lot of advice is, you know, to, 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 to be careful in these countries. Um, language is always seen as a cost. Um, translation is a pain. It's a cost. Interpreting all of these things are. And there's a kind of a distrust of language experts and language professionals um, in a lot of companies. So this idea of language being a problem. However, some problems get solved and some language problems get solved and that has to do with the economic attractiveness of the, of the country and some language problems don't get solved and people just have to make do with, um, with lingua francas or with English. Language policy three, if we align it here with, um, with De Swan's framework, um, gives agency to individuals. So as I said, he's, he's, he's overly enthusiastic and optimistic about this and uh, kind of overplays it, but it's an interesting idea. So what are we dealing with here? Um, the context that we're dealing with is uh, web two and, and moving on to, to web three. So um, first of all, the, the, the participatory web, the fact that people can uh, um, donate content and create their own content. And he sees this as a complete game changer in terms of globalization. And of course, Web2 has developed into a much more participatory, collaborative and, and social web. And here the agency is given to individuals. And he argues that individuals um, have the power now to globalize themselves, uh, to collaborate uh, equally and evenly uh, across the world. So what kind of speech communities do we have? We need to think a little bit here about how the web has developed. Um, and if we look at the origins of the web um, and the internet, it was very much uh, developed, first of all, by uh, a monolingual culture, by, by a monolingual group. Um, and secondly, um, the ideology of the web, the founding ideology, was one of um, equality across the whole web. So the idea was that the web should be the same everywhere and should be experienced in the same way. So this is a little bit like the singularity uh, that Penny Cook talks about that was aimed for in language policy one. So by countries and states that it should be the same. And of course we have a lot of arguments around fairness and equality uh, uh, which are used to, uh, to reinforce monolingual norms. So you had an ideology which favoured monolingualism because the web should be the same everywhere and you had monolingual people developing it to a large extent. As more countries got involved, as the technology developed, as e-commerce started to develop, uh, more languages started to appear and uh, you had a more multilingual web, but it was multilingual with limits. 
So it was a kind of a partial multilingualism. Uh, again, the big languages are there, um, fewer of the smaller languages and uh, not all information in all languages uh, being available to everyone. What's happened then with, with Web 2 and, and onwards is that as, as uh, individuals can create their own content and can curate their own spaces and their own speech communities, um, you have a situation where you have more and more um, multilingualism. So you don't have to wait for the multilingual spaces to be created for you. You can create them for yourself and you can create the content. You don't have to wait for content to be created. So I'm using hyperlingual to, to refer to this. And um, Anna Pauls has used the term to uh, talk about the societal um, impact of super diversity. And she talks about it leading to hyperlingual societies. What I, so what I'm talking about here is something similar. So it's increasingly differentiated speech communities and more and more um, speech communities uh, being, being developed online. And if we look at the policy aspect here, we're moving further and further away from, from macro level policies or even meso level policies to much more micro level. And there's been a strong focus and a lot of research on these micro level policies, local normativities and local um, management within these online um, speech communities. And, and that's been um, a, a strong focus um, for our work. And if we were to sum up this era, I guess it's about individuals collaborating to solve their language problems with technology. Um, and I've put in parentheses and with the market because the market aspect is the bit that we sometimes forget about. So uh, that the spaces are not provided for free. They're, 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 they're in someone's interests and they're economically useful spaces and they're, they, they, um, they earn money and that's why they're there. Um, and so, the, uh, so the technology is there, the technology is a crucial aspect of it, but it's about the individuals working together um, with technology and being supported by, by market processes and in turn supporting market processes um, through that. So what comes next? As I said, Deswan, or sorry, not Deswan, Friedman stops uh, with uh, Globalization 3. Um, but of course, we all know that we're, we're on the cusp of or even started into um, uh, Web 4. And uh, I think the consensus is that in Web 4, machines will probably be the agents and have the primary agency and technology is seen to have uh, the primary agency. So what might this look like for us? So the, the, the context here is Web 4 or the smart web. Um, and what we're looking at is an increasing uh, integration um, of technology into our lives and um, the technology will become more and more invisible. So I guess the iconic image for the coming era is some sort of robot who, who runs your house and, and does things for you. And I think my final image is actually something like that. But, but in, the, in, the, in the time to come and even already, the technology is um, much less visible actually. It's much more integrated into our everyday lives. And, and um, a good example here is the wearable device. So, you know, the Fitbits um, and things like that, which monitor our health, but also there are some really um, exciting uh, wearable devices which offer um, uh, instantaneous uh, translation and interpreting for people. So, you know, we, we have the, the, uh, the, the babble fish or the kind of the 1970s uh, science fiction uh, series coming true and um, that you know we will be able to do this and these the beauty of these machines of course is the the artificial intelligence and the, and the learning that they can do so they can learn um, so they're not just filled up with um, a lot of uh, language and left and uh, they're constantly learning and developing and they're learning from us and what's also predicted is this idea of machines as intelligent agents so um, um, so un unlike, I suppose, Web 2 and Web 3, where individuals are collaborating together and supported by technology, here we'll have kind of proactive um, intelligent agents who will go out and kind of solve our language problems for us and understand our, our, our desires and our needs. And in fact, perhaps create a problem free uh, linguistic path or speech community for us online. 
So I don't, I, I struggle to understand this. I'm reading a lot about it and talking to a lot of people and it seems sort of uh, science, you know, so, as I said, science fiction, but these kinds of things are, are happening already. And, and I mean, on a small scale, we can think of things like um, our spell checkers and things like that, which, which learn from us now. Um, and anticipate us. So, you know, you can, you can program in a, a mistake if you make a mistake, but if it's your mistake, it will keep giving it back to you. So we refer to your norms, not to kind of uh, pre-programmed norms. And in terms of speech communities, um, the, uh, I suppose if we have kind of exponential sort of hyperlingualism and more and more differentiated speech communities, we're coming down to a situation now where it's almost idiolingualism, where it's almost the individual um, creating their online language space um, and that this is designed for them um, in their own image and, and likeness. Um, and the, um, an idea for marketing is the, the market of one. Um, and that's sort of the, the, the dream of, of Web4. Um, and smart technology. So for instance, um, where mass marketing was the, 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 the thing in the, the era of the multinational companies, the, you know, the globalization too, um, here it's actually about the fact that with smart manufacturing, I can get something that's entirely mine, that's entirely um, made for me. And that's, that actually is now economically viable and is possible through smart manufacturing and technology. Um, and the, you know, the, the device, the smart, uh, the smart agent, whatever, will almost kind of uh, predict what we want and, and satisfy those desires. And I was even thinking when I was preparing my, my talk here today, you know, this kind of, these kinds of things are happening and we don't always acknowledge them. So um, with my PowerPoint, my very basic PowerPoint, I was thinking that, um, you know, uh, previously, um, maybe 10 years ago, I would have chosen a template and I can still do that. I can choose a template. And if I use the template, I can create a, a PowerPoint, which is quite similar to other people's if they use the template. And I remember going to, going to conferences first and everyone had the same kinds of templates and so that everything looked the same. And, but now I don't have to pick a template. So I can just start writing my, my, my PowerPoint and the, um, the PowerPoint will generate design ideas. And I can reject them and say I don't like them, and it will come up with other ones. Now, of course, it's 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 drawing from a from a pool of things online, but it starts to learn about the things that I like. Uh, it starts to learn about the words that I'm using, and it becomes tailored for me. So my presentation is entirely different and looks entirely different to someone else's. So it's it's a very small example, but, but these kinds of things are happening, um, are already happening, and we are able to tailor things and make things. Uh, that are individual um, to us. So I suppose if we were going to think about what this era might be, it would be kind of, well, what problems do we have? So our, our kind of language problems may, may disappear, we may not even know them. And again, something that I've been tracking for a long number of years is the categorization of speakers in online contexts. And so, you know, if we go right back, it's probably about 20 years now, or maybe 15, certainly, you know, when you went online, um, and you wanted to interact um, with a company or, or with a medium or something like that, the first thing they wanted to do was to get you to categorize yourself. So you had to pick um, where you were, your location, your, um, your language, all these sorts of things. That's largely disappeared now because again, um, uh, th th they've learned, uh, the, the technology has learned about you and the more you use it and the more information you give it, it's learned. So in a sense, I might not realize that I need to pick a language or that there is a language problem or that there are people out there who, who might want other languages because my path will be um, made uh, problem free um, as, I, as, I, as I traverse these, these spaces in the future. So I may not even realize I have language problems. So I just thought we might kind of sum up in the sense of being ready in terms of our approaches and our methods. And I, I was, I'm using here um, Bernard Schwalski's um, three pillars of kind of management beliefs and practices in relation to these particular eras and where maybe our focus has been and what we've learned and how this can help us. So I suppose in, in language policy one, our aim was a much more macro one. Um, 
we, we documented and described this management level very, very much and probably assumed um, practices and beliefs on the basis of, of this such a top down level um, or uh, they were reported on in, in surveys, in censuses, in, in, in interviews, things like that. Language policy too, as I said, is an era that we have probably neglected quite a bit. Um, there have been, there are studies of it, but, but not, not, I think language policy one, language policy three, we, we focus much, much more on. Um, but again, a lot of similar methods and ideas and approaches to, to uh, language policy one. Language policy three, we've shifted very much towards um, pra the practice level and the micro level. Um, where we're really observing and analysing very closely. And we have a lot of tools for this. We've discourse centred online ethnography, Yanis Andalusopoulos' work. Um, we have a virtual ethnography. We have lots of tools um, for looking at this and for observing and analysing and for um, inferring beliefs and, and, uh, and that from, from those in a very fine-grained uh, way. Um, and we, we know a lot about management at micro level. So we know a lot about how individuals manage themselves within these spaces. So in terms of, but, but we're, so we're kind of inferring the management from the practices as opposed to maybe where we started out where we inferred practices from top down management. And then if we think about the, the era to come, I suppose two things that strike me are, first of all, I think we need to go back to the macro level and we and the meso level and really understand this this top down management and how this is happening and that probably uh, needs different approaches and and I think it will be much much harder to kind of infer that from um from practices in the future and a second thing I think is that um these practices will be much much harder to actually investigate themselves so what we have is um, more and more private spaces and individualized spaces. Um, so while for language policy three, we could look at Facebook, uh, we could look at Twitter and we could see what was happening there. Um, now um, people are migrating much more to, to private spaces and using private spaces um, much more. Um, so how do we access those and how do we understand those and how do we participate in those? And the technology is supporting that. It's supporting people in, in, in moving much more to, um, to private settings where they can have smaller and smaller groups uh, to interact with. So how do we actually access those? I think that's, that's going to be a key um, challenge for us in terms of being ready. So maybe then some questions that will... Uh, take us towards um, language policy four and things that I think we, sh we should start to think about. So first of all, which language problems are anticipated and solved and which are not? And which speech communities and categorizations can be constituted for speakers and which cannot? So even though we might feel, you know, uh, we might uh, like Friedman's idea of the individual having control and then the machine having control, Someone is organizing all of this and, and, and it's being organized somewhere and some categorizations are permitted, some speech communities are permitted, some language problems will continue to be solved and some won't. So, so which are and which aren't? And I think we're the people who can address and answer those questions. What kinds of speech communities are being designed and what kind aren't? And what, what does the technology allow or enable or create and what doesn't it? I think this is a key issue for us. How do we work with increasingly private individualized speech communities? Um, discovering them, finding them, accessing them. So I was listening to a talk recently about um, a corpus that's been created of minority language uh, data. Um, and it's coming from WhatsApp uh, because WhatsApp is, you know, one of these private spaces that is very hard to access. And what the speakers have to do is they have to um, sign up for this corpus and they have to agree to donate their messages and they export their messages and they can edit their messages before they export them. So this is a, a great way to do it and it builds up an interesting corpus, but it's a very different way of observing practices and trying to understand how those spaces work. Um, and of course, you know, there's an inbuilt kind of uh, editing or uh, reflection on the part of the speakers. It would be great to try to capture that as, as, as we get data from these spaces. But again, uh, we need to think about how we're going to, to work with those. Because, you know, 
if we look at something like Facebook, um, private conversations and interactions are migrating away from, from those forums. As researchers, I think a really important question to ask is what do we find, um, what do we not find, and what doesn't find us? So um, I have to put my hand up here and say I've been very guilty of the treasure trove approach to studying online language policy. And yippee, you know, you find a, a wonderful uh, language ideological debate online and you, and you start to analyze it. But as I've learned more about the technology and how it works, and particularly the political economy of the technology, so how it actually functions, how it makes money, um, how certain types of information um, get mainstreamed, uh, get shared, get passed on, get become prominent. I've increasingly asked, you know, well, how did I find this? And, you know, with my intelligent agent working for me in the future, how did this find me? And, and I think we have to ask those questions as well. And also, what are we not finding and what doesn't find us? So I think uh, those kinds of things are, are crucial. Um, how are these spaces defined, designed, management, managed and created beyond the speaker level? So, okay, we need to look at speakers managing their own particular spaces, their own particular speech communities, but also what's happening um, above that at higher levels. And how are speakers guided to and through these new spaces and where are they not guided? So they're just some preliminary thoughts and ideas, and I'm sure you have other ones around um, how we can approach this new era. Yeah, and tracing the, the macro and the meso management, what's permitted, what sanctions exist. And this is very dull and very boring. Um, it probably involves looking at all sorts of cookies, GDPR, all kinds of things like that, um, in terms of how these spaces are actually made possible. Um, and, uh, you know, in whose interests are they for them to exist and for us to populate them and for us to interact on them. So this is kind of going right back up to all the agreements that we, we just tick a box and say, I agree, we need to work through all of these because that's the, that's the control. Um, that's where the control is happening and, um, and we need to understand that. So finally then, in terms of remaining relevant, I think we just need to continue to ask the same questions. You know, why is language being managed where and by whom and for what purposes? And not just the, I think we, we're focusing a lot on the kind of the speaker level management. And maybe we need to remember that those spaces are, um, are made available. Um, and that level of management is something we need to think about. Also acknowledging LP1 and LP2 will continue to exist. Countries don't cede control to, to, to country, sorry, countries don't cede control to companies and companies don't cede control to individuals. Um, it doesn't happen like that. They continue to exist. Uh, countries are still um, managing languages as are, as are companies. Um, I think we can critique, but also maintain concepts from LP1 in particular, which I think can help us to understand this macro level of management and what's going on. I think we need to balance a portfolio of concepts um, and be multilingual ourselves and multi-register in the sense of I think we need to be able to understand a language as system perspective still and to talk that and to, to look at that in terms of looking at macro spaces um, as well as a, as, as a language as repertoire um, uh, um, vocabulary also. In this, this problem is I think the coming era is, is, is very complicated and we need that broad portfolio of, of, of concepts for it. Um, it does give us the opportunity, I think, to close the gap, something Pennycook has talked about between segregationist, which we could think of as particularly LP1 and LP2 views of language, and integrationist, um, LP3 and LP4, I would say, and between macro and micro sociologies of language. We need to develop multidisciplinary perspectives. We absolutely need to include um, technology um, in our perspectives and technologists. And we need to get to grips with the political economy of the Web4 um, technology. Thank you very much.